Okay, ball pythons, racks, or the full shebang terrarium. I've been saying for a while in previous videos, assessing welfare and what I, I think based on welfare science and this and that, but a study has come out as recent as February. What I would like to do is that I would like to go through this together. We're going to read this together because it's not particularly long, so I would like to not gloss over this. And what we're going to do is read this together. Is we're not going to be fluffy. We're not going to be like, oh yeah, I agree this this because I want this to be true. What we're going to do is we're going to nitpick this study. Now this is a super interesting study, and I think it's a critical study as well. So I there's some things in this study that I find really cool, and some of it's really hilarious. That they. they some of the people they're calling out in this study. <laughs> oh, it probably won't remain in the study. Let's just read this together. <laughs> right, let's go. Right, right. This study, animal appropriate housing of bull pythons, behavior based evaluation of two types of housing systems. Now, this study was done in Germany by the authors there. Uh, Tina, Marcus and Caroline. I'm not going to try and pronounce the German surnames. I apologize. But the first thing that I want to point out with this study is that it's not peer-reviewed. So we can effectively consider this grey literature. It's a good piece of literature, but it's not peer-reviewed, so it's not that, not reached that level of credibility. But I suspect it will be peer-reviewed. I just want to get in here early and make the video before it's no longer new, if that makes sense. So I could have waited a year to wait until it was peer reviewed, but I want to look at this now and um, it'll be interesting to see which things later on are taken out after peer review or changed after peer review. So I think this video, regardless quite right now, is going to be quite interesting. So considering animal welfare, animals should be kept in animal appropriate and stress-free housing conditions in all circumstances. To assure such conditions, not only basic needs must be met, but also possibilities must be provided that allow animals in captive care to express all species typical behaviours. Rack housing systems for snakes have become increasingly popular and are widely used. However, from an animal welfare perspective, they are no alternative to furnished terrariums. In this study, we therefore evaluated two types of housing systems for bull pythons. By considering the welfare aspect, animal behaviour. In part one of this study, bull pythons with a sample size of 35, that is a good sample size. One of the things people always criticise any study that doesn't correlate with, um, you know, giving a snake the bare basics is, oh, the, the sample size is too small, it's too small. Well, a sample size of 35 snakes, that's good. That's a good sample size. Yes, so these bull pythons were housed individually in a conventional rack system. The pythons were provided with a hiding place and a water bowl. Temperature control was automatic and the lighting in the room served as indirect illumination. In part two of the study, the same bull pythons, after at least eight weeks, were housed individually in furnished terrariums. The size of each terrarium was correlated with the body length of each bull python. The terrariums contained substrates, a hiding place, possibilities for climbing, a water basin for bathing, an elevated basking spot, and living plants. The temperature was controlled automatically, and illumination was provided by a fluorescent tube and a UVB lamp. The shown behaviour spectrum differed significantly between the two housing systems, with a p-value of less than 0.05. Not only is there a difference, but there's a statistical difference. It's statistically significant, and I can't say that tongue twister. <laughs> the four behaviours, basking, climbing, burrowing and bathing, could only be expressed in the terrarium. Abnormal behaviours that could indicate stereotypies were almost exclusively seen in the rack system. The results show that the housing of bull pythons in a rack system leads to a considerable restriction in species typical behaviours. Thus, the rack system does not meet the requirements for animal 
appropriate housing. The ball python has been a popular terrarium house exotic pet for more than 30 years. In Europe and North America it is frequently bred, but also imports of wild snakes or farmed breeds are commonly available. Due to the various breeding goals, i.e. coloration, pattern or scale of skin, the ball python has a highly variable phenotypes and thus is still one of the most frequently kept snake species. The international website Wild of Ball Pythons for the registration of colour morphs lists 7,221 different colour shades and patterns. Although the ball python is listed in the Washington Endangered Species Act Appendix 2 and the German Directive VOEG 338-97 Appendix B did that first time, <laughs> it is exempt from reporting requirements. Thus, the number of bull pythons kept as pets in Europe and North America is speculative. The bull python is native to West and Central Africa. It mainly inhabits arid savannas with temperature extremes ranging from 16 degrees Celsius to 43 degrees Celsius, and relative humidity ranging from 60% to 95%, with high seasonal variation due to the dry December to March and rainy seasons April. The German expert report on minimum requirements for keeping of reptiles stipulates a temperature range of 26 to 32 with a nighttime reduction of 5 degrees. A localised heat spot, i.e. a basking spot, with 38 degrees Celsius must be provided. During the daytime, the bull python often hides in rodent burrows or abandoned termite mounds. These possibilities for hiding offer the snake relative consistent temperature and humidity conditions. At dusk, the bull python leaves its hiding place to forage or fulfill other needs. Being a synanthropic species, the bull python is often near settlement and cultivated fields where it feeds on rodents. Due to its body shape, it can be considered a ground-dwelling snake, although it can be seen at low heights on trees, sufficiently robust shrubs or termite mounds. Like almost all snakes, the bull python can swim, but its life cycle is not dependent on the presence of water bodies. It uses bathing possibilities, especially during the molting phase. Now I just want to pause here and I want to look at this paragraph where it says the bull python is in fields where it feeds on rodents. Yes, that is true, but I don't know why in their literature review they have none of the studies published by Luca Lucili. I don't know, I would I would just like to see some mention of uh, the, any, any of Luca Lucili's um, studies and I would like to see just at least some mention of how many birds they're eating and things like that. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know why these studies were either not found or omitted here. A bit strange. But anyway, the typical housing system used for pythons is the so-called rack. <laughs> so-called rack. <laughs> it was first designed in North America around 1992. A rack system is a shelving system with individual bins arranged as drawers. In some models, the bins have individual lids. In other models, they are open on the top and close flush with the upper shelf board. All bins have ventilation holes. Rack systems usually have no lighting elements, so the ambient light provided is the only illumination. Heating elements are installed per drawer level and heating pads or heating cables are most frequently used. The heating elements should be equipped with a thermostat that prevents overheating and undercooling. Racks are available in various sizes. Most importantly, the bins should be flat. Depending on the manufacturers, the synthetic material used for bins varies from clear acrylic glass to non-transparent plastic. Regarding the bin furnishings, several variants are available. The most used substrate is newspaper, but also rodent litter or bark mulch are used. 
most variants include a hiding place and a water bowl for drinking. In some cases, arranged as a bowl with a crawl space underneath, some variants contain additional structural elements, such as artificial plants, a water basin for bathing, or tree branches. Rack housing offers the advantage of quick and complete cleaning, and little space and time are needed to accommodate and maintain many snakes. Because each animal is kept individually, precise animal monitoring is easily possible. Moreover, the sparse furnishing keeps the injury risk low. Further arguments of breeders and advocates of rack housing can be found in the relevant literature. And it's interesting that they have cited Kevin McCurley, um, 2011. So if I, this book um, is a Camaro edition and Kevin McCurley. So that book is what the study is citing there. And include the following. The animals accept feed more readily in a rack system than in a terrarium. Refusing food occurs less frequently. Due to the higher feed intake, the animals grow faster, resulting in a younger breeding age. The animals reproduce more readily. Accommodation in the rack system is more natural for the ball python, which in nature lives in termite mounds. The flat design of the bins is thought to cause less stress for the snake. Animals housed in rack systems are considerably less aggressive. Light causes stress for crepuscular and nocturnal animals, a further argument for indirect or no illumination in rack drawers. Arguments against rack housing are comprehensively presented in the expert report of work group 8. Okay, so I'm going to skip past all these working groups because I'm not going to read them all. Basically, a lot of working groups uh, disagree with Kevin McCurley. In the expert report, the working group pointed out the lacking possibility for three-dimensional locomotion due to the low height of the rack bins. Furthermore, the small space allowance leaves little room for furnishings, excluding possibilities for hiding in various places, dry, humid, elevated and for climbing. So the choice between variation in the places in the habitat, dry, humid, elevated. Depending on the substrate, burrowing may also be impossible. Another concern, not directly addressed in the expert room, is illumination. At the most, rack systems allow illumination via ambient light or via an LED strip fixed to the bin lid. Spotlights, for example with UVB light, cannot be installed. In contrast to rack systems, terrariums have been used much longer for housing animals. In 1964, the German Society for Herpetology and Herpetoculture was founded in Germany. A terrarium is an enclosure or a container in which various species of animals can be housed. The interior climatic conditions are adjusted to the needs of the housed animal species. At least one side of the terrarium is transparent. In contrast to an aquarium, terrestrial elements and airspace predominant. Due to the rapid technological development in almost every area, today's terroristics is highly progressive. Daytime dependent variation of temperature, lighting and humidity can precisely be planned, simulated and controlled. A skilled use of UVB lamps, irrigation systems and nebulizers in the terrarium allows creating a microclimate that is nearly identical to the microclimate in the natural habitat. In good terroristics practice, the animal is provided with various elements for expressing its needs, climbing possibilities, various hiding places, substrate for burrowing, and plants are included according to the housed animal species. 
Living plants not only ensure the formation of a natural microclimate, but also provide structural change over time. Various types of light sources can be used for illumination. Energy efficient LED bulbs can provide basic illumination. To simulate natural sunlight for the basking spot, UV lamps of appropriate wavelengths and intensity should be selected according to the animal species. Similarly, heating elements should optimally radiate heat like the sun, i.e. from top to the bottom. Now, there's one thing in this that I don't necessarily agree with. I don't necessarily agree that you have to have or that you should have life plants. I agree that structurally it adds a fluidness to the enclosure where the structure might change over time as the plant grows or there might be a higher oxygen content in the terrarium or the human microclimate but personally I think a humid hide box kind of negates the need for the microclimate produced by that plant personally I think that I don't particularly disagree with providing live plants I, I, I tend to enjoy it I just don't I, I wouldn't say that people have to Beyond the body of specialised literature, we found a few arguments against housing the bull python in a terrarium. This is going to be good. But these arguments are based on observations and have not been analysed scientifically. According to the German expert report on minimum requirements for the keeping of reptiles of 1997, the bull python does not feel safe in a terrarium exceeding a certain height because this snake is a ground dweller and not a good climber. A terrarium that is too high poses the risk of the animal falling and getting injured. Furthermore, due to the perception of the surrounding environment, e.g. through a glass front, the snake feels threatened and often reacts very aggressively. Lighting additionally stresses the bull python. All these factors can lead to the refusal of food slow growth and poor reproduction rates in a terrarium. Moreover, growth of health hazardous bacteria and moulds often occurs in a terrarium. I can see where this is going with this. It seems to be bringing up McCurley quite a lot and it's stipulating what he has said prior to getting into the meat of the study and I assume from the results they found does not correlate with what McCurley says. It's definitely calling out McCurley and I, as much as it amuses me I don't think it's probably appropriate in an academic um, journal article. I don't know, it's an interesting one. I think once this goes through peer review it would be interesting to see whether they make the authors take out all this stuff about McCurley. But I find it funny, nonetheless, that... <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's carry on. Many wild animals kept in captivity show stereotypical behaviours. A stereotypy is a repetitive, invariant behaviour or movement pattern without function or goal and is often seen due to inadequate husbandry conditions. Therefore, stereotypies are often considered as indicators of impaired well-being caused by acute or past suffering, as seen almost exclusively in circumstances of confinement. Situations can arise in which animals in which an animal is strongly motivated to show a behavior but cannot express it because the necessary circumstances are not given. Endogenous and exogenous stimuli can induce a readiness to act that is displayed at varying intensity. However, a desire consuming final action never happens because the human made environment does not allow it. Such a conflict situation evokes a coping strategy by which the animal seeks alternative possibilities to cope with a frustrating situation that it can neither avoid nor change. The associated action often begins with aggressive behaviour which is expressed strongly or weakly depending on the animal species. If this behaviour does not change the situation, deprivation develops. 
If the circumstances continue to remain unchanged, certain stimuli will lead to behaviour patterns that have no function or goal. In invariant environmental conditions, these behaviour patterns are shown increasingly often and manifest as a stereotypy. Stereotypies can be divided into two categories. One is referred to as redirected action, whereby a behaviour is directed at an inadequate ob object, e.g. a male tortoise trying to copulate with a shoe. The other category is the so-called vacuum activity, whereby no object is used, e.g. walk stereotypies, or in the present study, crawl stereotypies. A walk or crawl stereotypy can be based on one of two functional areas of behaviour. The behaviour may represent an escape attempt or a search behaviour, a food, meat or other resources. An escape attempt always indicates a state of arousal along discomfort and thus a reduced well-being. Therefore, the housing environment should be designed in a way that allows the animal to express their natural behavioural repertoire and to cope with all arising challenges. Moreover, enriched housing conditions can invoke positive emotions, which cause improved well-being and contribute to solving behavioural problems. The aim of the present study is a scientific comparative evaluation of bull python husbandry by considering animal welfare aspects when housing these animals in a rack system or a terrarium. Okay, so now we're getting into the animals, the materials and the methodology. So, 35 bull pythons were used for this study. 25 of them were male, 9 were female, and 1 was juvenile of an undetermined sex. Three of the pythons had been handed in by private persons, whereas the others had been confiscated from five snake keepers by authorised agencies. 13 of the pythons were between 3 and 18 years old. The age of the other pythons was unknown. Now, because of the Luca Lucili studies, and we know that um, males and females differ behaviourally in how they hunt and how they climb, etc., and they, to the degrees that they do these behaviours, Maybe that should have been like a 50-50 split, but we, we are we're nitpicking there. At the beginning of this study, the pythons had a body length ranging from 53 to 148 centimeters, and a body weight ranging from 0.11 to 2.50 kg. We did not find a sex specific length or weight distribution. Approximately half, i.e. 18 of the snakes, had a colour or pattern, or both, basically divergent from the wild. In feeding intervals of two weeks, the snakes were offered defrosted mice, warmed up to body temperature. One juvenile snake, number 31, received hoppers, the adult snakes received adult mice, and the larger snakes received subadult sub rats. The numbers and sizes of the feeder animals were tailored to each snake based on personal preference. Yes, so 18 pythons refused to eat dead feeder animals despite multiple offerings during various daytime and with simulation of prey movement. Therefore, these pythons were offered living mice from the third feed onwards, and five of them began eating. From the sixth feed onwards, living water mammoth mice and rats were offered. Seven snakes that had not accepted feed until then ate those feeder animals, but another six feed refusing pythons did not eat because young small guinea pigs were not available. Because young small guinea pigs were not available, defrosted mice were covered with pieces of guinea pig fur. With this method, all re feed refusing snakes finally ate. The specialization on only one species of feeder animal was due to the previous husbandry conditions in which the snakes were mostly fed newborn guinea pigs. For the present study, the pythons were kept in two types of housing systems. First, they were housed in a rack system, afterwards were housed in terrariums. Now this goes over the housing and the rack system. 
the rack system consisted of a clear acrylic polypropylene bins, 70 by 40 with 16, with ventilation holes on the front and back and sides. The bins were placed precisely fitted as drawers in a shelving system consisting of a non-transparent plastic frame and boards made of oriented strand board. The back half of the bin was heated with a heating cable and pad, controlled via a thermostat. The daytime temperature from 8am to 8pm was on average 28 degrees Celsius, at the back end measured above the heating element, and on average 26 degrees at the front end of the bin. In the time from 8pm to 7am, the temperature at each end was 3 degrees less, so basically a 3 degree drop in temperature at night. The bottom was covered with newspaper, an upside down plastic plant pot with an entrance hole of 8cm diameter served as a hiding place. During the molting period, moist towels were put inside the hiding place. Fresh water was provided ad libitum that was fixed to the bottom and one side of the bin with a hook and loop fashioning strap. So basically it was strapped to the side. For the nighttime observation, one side of each drawer had a hole of 0.5 diameter which allowed illuminating the drawer with red lights, an LED of 650 nanometers. This wavelength lies outside the visual spectrum of the ball python. So basically a typical rack. Actually, to be fair, that's more than what some ball python keepers actually give. Most of the time from what I see on ball python Facebook groups is actually just a water bowl. And that's it. So, right in the terrarium, for housing the pythons in a terrarium, three sizes of terrariums were used. They met the minimum requirements for housing reptiles. The smallest terrariums measured 100 by 50 by 50. The medium size measured 120 by 60 by 60, and the largest measured 150 by 80 by 80. Basic illumination in all terrariums was provided via a fluorescent tube. For protection the tube was installed in a moisture proof bracket. As spotlight we used a UV lamp 39 centimeters above the basking platform in a protective wire case. The temperatures during the daytime 8 o'clock to 8 o'clock were 38 degrees underneath the spotlight and 25 degrees in the coolest area. During the night time the measured temperatures was on average 24 degrees. The substrate was a mixture of soil, sand, bark mulch and loam powder. In the back half the substrate was raised to a height of 35cm to enable the snakes to burrow. The average substrate thickness in, in the front half was 10cm. Each terrarium had a hiding place like the one used in the rack system and an elevated basking platform underneath the UV lamp. Furthermore, each terrarium contained a water basin and a living plant, which was held in place by a layer of gravel. The remaining furnishings included trunks, branches, twigs, clumps of grass, roots, moss, rocks and bark, which had been collected outdoors. The arrangement of the furnishings was identical, but the use of natural materials did not allow a 100% match. For video recordings, each terrarium was illuminated with a single red LED bulb that was controlled on a time. Can I actually open make these larger? So this is the terrarium. So it's nothing like overboard. It's literally a standard viv with basking lamp and a fluorescent tube to light the vivarium and just things collected from outside so actually this is very very cheap to set up bear that in mind that this isn't really monstrously expensive at all okay all pythons were observed in the rack system and terrariums in the rack system a camera was installed at the front end of the drawer and turned on for five consecutive days all lights on the camera were covered with tape so that only the red light from the led bulb and the ambient lighting in the room served as light sources to allow an adaptation period, the camera was installed on the rack five days before recording. The behaviour observation began at 5pm for 24 hours. The nighttime observation in the terrarium was also facilitated by red LED illumination. For practical reasons, the daytime observation was done without camera, although the switched off camera remained in the terrarium. Based uh, because an ethogram for bull pythons did not exist, 
we created one based on the ob observations. It does not include interactions with other individuals because all ball pythons were single housed during the whole study. Feeding behaviour is also excluded because feeding was a planned event that the individual could not control. Okay, so let's look at the ethogram for the ball python now. Okay, so the behaviours they've predefined and are looking for going forward are the following. We've got crawling forward, moving backwards, lifting the front body up, climbing, burrowing, moving the head, exploration behaviour directed at the camera, uh, comfort behaviour, basking, bathing, resting in hiding place with side wall contact, resting outside of hiding place, not under the basking spot, coiled. Resting outside of the hiding place, not under basking spot, stretched out. Defensive behaviour, aggressive behaviour, feeding behaviour, uh, drinking. Other behaviours include a yawning, pushing their mouth against the barrier, pathological behaviour such as warbling and stargazing. Behaviour assessments. The behaviours were documented in 10 minute intervals, resulting in a data set of 144 behaviour units per day. This assessment was done on five days for each housing system. For comparative data analysis, the area under the curve was calculated. For a more precise comparison of behaviour rhythms in the two housing systems, we divided the day in three periods. The presumed main activity period, period one, from late afternoon to early night was between 4 p.m. and 11 p.m. It was followed by the nighttime phase until 7 a.m. in the next day and then the daytime phase, which was until dusk. The collected data was first transcribed in Microsoft Excel. For stat analysis, we used IBM SPPS statistics. Differences between the housing systems in the frequency of shown behaviors was determined with the T-test and the Wilcoxon test. The level of significance was set at P less than 0.05. In this study, we differentiated 17 behaviours. Defensive or aggressive behaviour was never shown, nor was moving backwards. Moving the head was never shown as a separate movement, but could be observed associated with other behaviour components. Table 3 lists the relative frequency of all behaviours displayed in a 24 period in the rack system and the terrarium. So let's have a little look at table 3. 15% of the time in the terrarium on average was spent crawling forward compared to just 7% in the rack. Climbing obviously couldn't occur in the rack at all and obviously 7% in the terrarium. Burrowing occurred for 1% on average of the time in the terrarium and nothing in the rack. Exploring behaviour directed at the camera. They didn't do it in the terrarium, but they did it in the rack. Obviously, they couldn't bask in the rack, but they spent 9% of their time basking in the terrarium. Uh, resting inside the hiding space, uh, C3. So, 53% on average of the time spent hiding was in the rack, whereas 33% in the terrarium. Resting outside of the hiding place coiled, 11% in the rack, 11% in the terrarium, not much different really. Resting outside of the hiding place stretched out, 14% in the rack, 18% in the terrarium. Drinking and yawning is pretty much going to be negligible because you can pretty much do both anyway. Pushing the mouth against the barrier, 11% in the rack system and 0.4% in the terrarium. That's interesting. So, essentially, they displayed stereotypy behaviours in the rack, but not in the terrarium. And then pathological behaviours, 0.12% uh, in the rack system and 0.03% in the terrarium. For eight behaviours, we found a statistically significant difference between the housing systems. The behaviour crawling forward was the most frequent locomotion behaviour in both housing systems. It occurred significantly more often in the terrarium than in the rack system. Pushing the mouth against the barrier occurred significantly 
more often in the rack system than, the, than in the terrarium. The python spent a large part of the day resting. Resting in hiding place was the most frequent varied and occurred significantly more often in the rack system than in the terrarium. Basking under the UV lamp, climbing and bathing occurred only in the terrarium. These behaviours could not occur in the rack system because of its structural design. Exploration behaviour directed at the camera, although possible in the terrarium, was shown only in the rack system. We also found daytime specific differences within and between the housing systems. In the following, P1 refers to the main activity phase from 4pm to 11pm, P2 to the nighttime phase from 11pm to 7am, and P3 to the early daytime phase from 7am to 3 essentially 4 p.m. In the terrarium, the behavior crawling forward was shown the most frequently during the P1 phase. So they were most active crawling around from 4 to 11, so basically at night before midnight, and considerably less during P2 and P3. During all periods, the values differed significantly from those in the rack systems. In addition, the differences between the periods were considerably smaller in the rack system than in the terrarium. So now we've got a box plot with extreme outliers. I don't know how good you can see it on video. If you can't see it clearly, I will blow it up in the actual video when I edit this. Okay, so you can see basically all the activity was mainly occurred from 4 p.m. to 11 p.m. So they were incredibly active in the terrarium and didn't do much in the rack, which logically, if you've got the room to use it, then that would explain why they use that they do use it. But if you can't move in a rack, then you, you can't move in a rack, really. So I'm not surprised by these results. During all periods, lifting the front body up was observed similarly often in both housing systems. This behavior occurred most frequently during P1, both in the rack system and in the terrarium. During the other two periods, it occurred less often in both housing systems. Climbing behavior in the terrarium also had its peak activity during P1 and occurred considerably less often during the other two periods. We made similar observations from the other three behaviors that could only be shown in the terrarium. Burrowing occurred most frequently during P1 followed by P2 and P3. Bathing was observed most frequently during P1, much less during P3, and not at all during nighttime period P2. Because of the set lighting intervals, basking could only occur during P1 and P3, which makes sense. The three albinotic bull pythons were basking for on average 10 minutes a day, much less than the other bull pythons which were basking for an average 144 minutes a day. The ball python spent two and a half, nearly two and a half hours a day basking. So we can see pretty much that the um, snakes aren't really too active from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. at all, but it's really during that 4 p.m. to 11 p.m. period that they really come alive. What I find really interesting is the crepuscular tendencies that these snakes are showing in the, in this study. See, from 7am to 3pm, so when everything kicks in and the day starts, the snakes bask to warm up, and you can see that in the amount of time that the snakes are basking in that period. I see this behaviour in my king snakes, and I, I have seen this behaviour in so many species that I have worked with in the shop as well. So. That's to be expected. And then in the evening, again, that crepuscular behavior, they're basking from 4 p.m. onwards, housing them in a way that allows them to be what they are, means that they act in a way that reflects what they are. And obviously the climbing's occurring during that afternoon, nighttime period as well. So that's, that's something that I find really interesting. Exploration behavior directed at the camera in the rack system occurred most frequently during P1 and rarely during the other two periods. It did not occur in the terrarium. Resting in hiding place was most frequently observed during P1 in the rack systems. During the other periods P2 and P3 combined, 
it occurred at similar frequencies within each housing system. So resting and hiding place C3 this occurred most in that 4 p.m. to 11 p.m. period. It's interesting that it occurred more frequently in the racks though. And I'm wondering what the author's interpretation of the data is going to be in the discussion later on. Uh, sorry, cold resting outside of hiding place was shown as similar frequencies in both housing systems during all daytime periods. We found a small behaviour peak during P1 in both the rack systems and the terrarium. During the other two periods, this comfort behaviour occurred at almost identical frequencies within each housing system. I mean, this doesn't particularly surprise me. Whether it's a terrarium or a rack, the, the snake can, can rest. That is one of the behaviours that a ball python can express in a rack. By contrast, stretched out resting outside of hiding place in the terrarium was observed more frequently during the active phase and the nighttime phase, and less frequently during the early day. This frequency of this comfort behaviour in the rack system during P1 and P2 was also higher than P3. So you can see here this comfort behaviour predefined by the authors occurred more frequently in the terrarium. We found a considerable difference between the two housing systems for the behaviour pushing against the barrier. Pushing the mouth against the barrier, sorry. The pythons showed this behaviour significantly more and almost exclusively in the rack system. In the rack system, we furthermore observed a significant difference in the behaviour between P1 and the other two periods. Pushing mouth against barrier in the rack there, look at that. A difference in drinking, yawning and pathological behaviours was not observed. The python showed all three behaviours sporadically during all daytime periods in both housing systems. Uh, that's to be expected really. So now we're getting into discussion, which will be the author um, explaining their, their interpretations of their results. This work compared the behaviour of bull pythons in two types of housing systems, namely a rack system and a terrarium. We found significant differences in the assessed behaviours depending on the housing system. The pythons in this study showed several often underestimated behaviours, basking, climbing, bathing, burrowing, indicating the necessity for a new definition of animal appropriate husbandry of the ball python. Although the results show that the pythons spent most of the day resting, in the rack system 80% and the terrarium 64% of a 24 hour day, the way in which they rested differed between terrarium and rack system, especially the stretched out resting outside of hiding place tended to occur more frequently in the terrarium. During the remaining time, the snakes also showed different frequencies in the assessed behaviour depending on the housing system. Locomotion behaviour such as climbing, burrowing were exclusively shown in the terrarium. This could not be expressed in the rack system due to spatial and structural conditions. The bull python is considered a ground running snake. However, it may occasionally crawl onto a termite mound or climb within waist height branch wood. An animal appropriate accommodation must therefore enable the snake to move in three dimensional space. Burrowing and bathing were shown less often, but they are important components of the behavioural repertoire and must be facilitated for the bull python. Although bathing, a type of comfort behaviour, plays a minor role in the natural behaviour of the bull python, this snake species has access to water in its natural habitat. Therefore, a large enough water basin should be provided in a housing system. Now, I'm going to say something here, because I don't know if you, we saw how small that that water bowl was in the rack compared to I don't know what size it was in the ter in the terrarium, but it it did look like that water bowl was deliberately small so that bathing basically I don't think the water bowl in the rack was large enough to allow bathing to occur properly anyway. Oh it's getting spicy. Many authors, e.g. McCurley, <laughs> believe the snakes do not need UVB light to stay healthy. However, the behaviour of the hair studied pythons clearly showed that UVB light is necessary for an animal appropriate environment that meets the needs of a bull python. The pythons actively visited the basking spot and used it daily for an average of 2.4 hours a day 
In a preliminary study, we had found that basking spots without UVB light were used significantly less than basking spots with UVB light. So it's not the heat that makes the significant difference, it's the UVB. That's what this is saying here. And it's so annoying where there's a certain subset of keepers. We know this to be true, we've seen this in our animals, but there's some people that are like, oh, it does. Oh, I don't know. We're not getting into that, we're just going to read the study. Just, oh, just can't. Just not get into it. Um, right. Most ball pythons have a daily rhythm in which they crawl to the basking spot when the light is switched on and stay there to warm up. This phase of warming up is followed by a phase of activity, which is followed by a phase of resting. Before the UVB light is switched off, the snake revisits the basking spot to warm up before dusk, when their phase of main activity begins. This natural rhythm clearly shows how the breeding of colour morphs, e.g. albino or albino, can restrict normal behaviours due to the heightened light sensitivity. The albinotic pythons in our study visit the basking spot under UVB light less often and for much shorter duration of around 10 minutes a day. 10 minutes compared to two, nearly two and a half hours, that's a ridiculous difference. Because basking with approximately 10% of the 12 hour light period made up, made up a large share in the behaviour repertoire of the ball python. The question arises in how far the selective breeding of albinotic morphs represents cases of so-called torture breeding in terms of the German Animal Welfare Act. Ooh, terminology such as torture breeding. I'm not sure I would call it torture, because typically when I think torture, I would think, you know, intentional. You're trying to torture something. I just think people are breeding without realising what they're doing, is what I honestly think. But that, that, that might just be terminology in their German legislation, which is why they're probably using it. The Python showed an excessive interest in the camera only when they were housed in the rack system. This finding indicates that the bull python accepts any stimulus to express exploration behaviour. Furthermore, it must explain why bull pythons easily feed and reproduce in a rack system. However, it is no evidence of animal appropriate housing but simply indicates that the snakes use every opportunity to compensate for the lack of stimuli. In a furnished environment with many stimuli, an animal new stimuli that neither meets a basic need nor poses a clear advantage or disadvantage for the animal does not elicit interest. So basically what this study is saying is the reason people have observed bull pythons breeding well in a rack is because they're deprived of any stimulation in this rack so when something does come along that is reinforcing and stimulating to them like food or breeding they're like on it on it something to do in the present study non-species typical behavior occurred significantly more frequently in the rack system than the terrarium in the rack housing 12 percent of all known behaviors were stereotypical movements in terrarium housing the respective frequency was less than 0.04%. The snakes crawled along the entire rack drawer and pushed their mouth against the sides, mostly the upper edges and partially against the top. Several of the pythons, i.e. 10 of them, stuck their noses through the ventilation holes and tried to widen them through burrowing movements. So the snakes that were, some of the snakes that were in the racks were trying to get out the racks. Because all pythons stopped showing this mouth pushing behaviour as soon as they were transferred into a terrarium. This behaviour cannot be considered a classical stereotypy in which the behaviour would be continued despite the change in circumstances. However, during the rack housing period, we observed individual differences. Several pythons, i.e. nine of them, showed the above described mouth pushing behaviour on the first day of rack housing, but then entered a rested a resting state. Others, 19 of them, initially showed a resting phase of several days, but once they started showing the mouth pushing behaviour, they did not stop showing it for the remaining rack housing period time. The remaining pythons, i.e. 10 of them, did not show a specific pattern in the mouth pushing behaviour, 
We could not link any other assessed parameter. By contrast, the pathological behavior wobbling was not shown depending on the housing type, but was exclusively shown by the color morph spider and those resembling it. With sample size of five of those. Presumably due to the deformation of the inner ear, these morphs have difficulties keeping their balance, especially in states of arousal. So what's interesting in this study is, is that some of these snakes were pushing trying to get out and then they entered a period of resting. But it's interesting that as soon as they were put in the terrarium, literally none of them is stopped because all pythons stopped showing this mouth pushing behavior as soon as they were transferred to a terrarium. And it's not a classical stereotypy where they would do that wherever they are because it was it's just a repetitive behavior to, to cope. It was directly because of the rack. In summary, our study results show that based on the assessed aspects, the housing in a rack system cannot be considered an animal appropriate accommodation for the bull python. The only animal based advantage of rack housing is the possibility for complete and fast cleaning. This aspect can be useful for keeping sick animals or facilitating quarantine conditions. Further aspects, such as the keeping of many animals in small spaces or the time-saving maintenance of these animals are in no case in the interest of the snakes. These conditions are rather reminiscent of an intensive mass husbandry in which economic aspects are considered to be of higher priority than animal welfare. Our results do not support the argument that the bull python accepts feed more readily in a rack system than a terrarium. With the rack system, we ne we initially encountered difficulties in feed acceptance, but these were most likely due to the kind of food offered. Because the snakes in both housing systems did not differ in their readiness to eat, the reason for previously reporting higher growth rate in the rack system from a curly is most likely a lower calorie use due to reduced locomotion. Crawling forward along made up 50% on average of all shown behaviours in the terrarium. In the rack system, the share of this locomotion behaviour was only 7%. Moreover, other calorie burning activities such as burrowing and climbing occurred only in the terrarium. These results suggest that the bull pythons used less energy for locomotion in the rack and thus could invest excess calories in growth. Snakes that move little have a reduced muscle mass and tonus, as compared with snakes that can express their full rep repertoire behavior. Due to the reduced muscle tonus, the snakes are less able to keep their body in certain positions. A bull python has the possibility to express all physiological movements because it lives in a furnished environment. It can be assumed to have stronger muscles than a bull python that lives in an unstructured and spatially restrictive environment. The statement of McCurley that illumination is a stressor for bull pythons could be disproved in our study. If light, if light had caused stress in the snakes, they would have not exposed themselves to it because they had always had the possibility to seek shelter in a hiding place. Even the albinotic pythons, for which the duration, on average 10 minutes a day, of basking differed considerably from that of the pigmented pythons on average 144 minutes or nearly two and a half hours a day. Use the offered light source. For albinotic pythons, a UV lamp of low intensity should be installed. Housing with indirect illumination or in complete darkness is animal welfare adverse and thus not acceptable. Darkness would amplify the scarcity of stimuli in the rat condition. A terrarium must be adapted to the needs of the housed individuals. For instance, the needs for protection in juvenile snakes should be met with multiple hiding places and many structural elements, such as dense vegetation. The terrarium dimensions alone cannot be used to determine if a terrarium is appropriate for housing a bull python. A unstructured large terrarium in which the animal appropriate needs are not met is not acceptable. The terrarium should contain several hiding places. Possibilities for climbing, substrate, for burrowing, and a large enough water basin that the snake can use for bathing 
and a basking spot with UVB light. The natural needs of the bull python are known, and thus must be met. Right, I'm not sure if this article should be calling out Macaulay as much as it is. I'm not sure if... See, Macaulay did produce books which are technically white literature. So, I suppose you could argue, because it's white literature and they're both white literature, then it's valid. It's a valid um, critique of another form of white literature. But, I know there's going to be other people that say, well, a book isn't another journal article. And that the authors shouldn't be doing it in this manner. It's just it'll be interesting to see if peer review will adjust this in some way. Obviously, there was the one spelling mistake that I found that said pace and should have been place, but in terms of the actual results of the study, that's not really doesn't negate anything that per se. There is a dogma and there is a accepted norm that. All Python keepers have to abide by that they're stressed by light and that Iraq's the best thing for them. I'm glad it's something that has been scientifically tested and has been written up. What we need now is a push for better conditions, especially in the home. If you're going to be a breeder and you're going to sacrifice welfare for economic values, like in the study stated, then there's nothing that I could say or anyone else that cares about welfare is going to say to convince you. Go do it. Do what you want because you're not going to listen to us anyway. But the issue is, is these big breeders telling people that they just want their bull python as a pet to put it in a box because that's better for it, when it's not. I don't know how many studies need to come out for the rest of the hobby to wake up and think that, okay, this is not acceptable, this is not what is appropriate for the species. The time has come now for the hobby to start recommending best practice rather than the minimal practice to get by. And that is not a rack. A rack is not best practice. No matter how many breeders tell you that a rack is the best thing for a bull python, it, it isn't. I'm not going to dwell on this and try to convince anyone. I don't think I need to convince anyone. I think the study should... Um, the data they've collected stands for itself. Make your own decision based on what this study presents to you. And um, I think people with common sense will come to the same conclusion. If you want to go back and read the actual study, it's open source, which means anyone can read it. I will link it in the description and I will link it in the pinned comment um, to make sure that people see it. If you enjoyed this video, give the video a like so the algorithm um, is positively affected by that like and also let me know what your thoughts are in the comments about this study i would like to um, engage with people and see what people think of this even if it's someone that wants to criticize and nitpick things do it i want to see criticism and i want to see the hobby moving forward with this new information that comes to light right the one thing that i want to be the takeaway thing from this video is if you've read watched this video and you've seen this study and you thought oh okay i've changed my mind and you feel bad because you're like i don't want to change my mind i don't want to feel like i've given up on what i believe to be true it's fine to change your mind in fact a good keeper is a keeper that changes their practices based on new information any sane person changes their opinion based on new information in any field it's not just relevant to reptiles so no one has to feel bad or guilty or feel like an idiot for changing their mind after seeing this study. It's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to change our mind going forward. Now the one thing that this study left out was all the Luca Lucilli studies about how bull pythons eat 70% birds and they're eating bush babies and parrots and whatnot. So if you want to see that video, click up here to watch that video.